So uh, hello everyone. I will just be waiting for a couple more minutes for more attendees to join and then we can start, okay? Okay, so I think we're set. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Ferris and I'll be your host for today's webinar, Remote Working, Help Your Employees Achieve Their Potential. Now, before we start, let's go through some housekeeping rules. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. I'll bring them at the end. And we will also have time for a Q&A session as well. So this is a recorded session, so those who couldn't attend or who would like to rewatch this webinar will receive a recording via email. Now, without further ado, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Ferris Lowry. I'm a product marketing specialist at Exo Platform. My role is to assist marketing and sales teams in their operations and present Exo Platform to the world. I have always been interested in creating content about a variety of topics, such as internal communications and the latest tech trends. I have already written a couple of articles about remote working prior to the confinement, and I consider myself a firm believer in this new way of work. Now, this webinar will be divided into three main parts. In the first part, I'll be discussing the current state of remote working and how companies have reacted to the pandemic. In the second part, I will try to answer a question that has been on everybody's lips lately, which is whether remote working will be the new normal. For that, we will walk through a brief history of remote working, its pros and cons, and employees' expectations prior to the pandemic. The last part will be a combination of tips and best practices for businesses who would like to pursue with remote working in the long term. Now, let's start with the first part, the current state of remote working. Now, with millions of people worldwide forced to stay at home, it has become crucial for businesses and governmental agencies as well to adapt their HR policies. This led to a growing interest in remote working with many business owners and individuals taking to Google, LinkedIn, Quora, and other social media channels to look for the right answers, best practices, and tools to collaborate effectively from home. Now, a quick look at Google Trends, for example, shows the increasing number of searches related to remote working. The results include thousands, if not millions, of articles and blog posts uh, with collaboration tips and best practices that can help and, more importantly, inspire a better remote working experience. Obviously, this interest was followed by a wide adoption of remote working policies, even by the most skeptic of businesses, since uh, nobody had a choice, really. Some companies were ready as they already had policies and plans in place to allow some of their employees to work remotely. This in turn made further development of these strategies to include more employees easier and response faster and more efficient. On the other hand, some companies were unprepared and had to develop plans fast in order to cope. Either way, adoption was high. The following graph from Gallup shows the percentage of US employees who have worked from home. We notice that the number doubles from 31% at the start of the lockdown to 62% around the beginning of April. 
other studies back these numbers. An MIT report titled COVID-19 and remote work, an early look at US data, suggests that half of Americans are working from home, the majority of which has just switched from commuting to working remotely, while others stated that they already work from home. Now, despite this wide adoption, uh, the transition from the office to the home wasn't that straightforward, and experience really played an important role. A recent Slack report shed the light on the difference between experienced and newly remote employees. Well, it comes with no surprise that experienced remote employees claimed that their companies were well prepared and organized to collaborate effectively, that they can communicate easily with their peers, and that they know their way around their company intranet, knowledge base, or any other tool. The report also examines the difficulties faced by remote employees in terms of overall satisfaction with working conditions and arrangements, productivity, and more importantly, sense of belonging. Now, despite these difficulties, uh, the difficulties faced by many uh, businesses during the last couple of months, feedback was more or less positive in general. Gallup found in a recent survey that 59% of employees who have been working remotely prefer to continue as much as possible even when restrictions are lifted. Managers and decision makers more or less share the same view as reported by Gartner survey. Nearly three in four CFOs or 74% plan to shift at least 5% of previously on-site employees to permanent remote positions in the long term as it represents a great opportunity to cut costs all while maintaining productivity. Now, the couple of months we have spent working at home and the favorable feedback of many will inevitably raise the question of whether working remotely will be the new normal. To answer this question, we would have to take a look at the history of remote working, its pros and cons, and more importantly, the expectations of employees prior to this pandemic to figure whether it will be just a passing trend or a new, or a new way of work that has been uh, long in the making. Now, working from home is by no means a new trend. I mean, if we dig deep in the history of remote working, we would find out it was the norm actually hundreds of years ago. Everyone worked from home, from carpenters and blacksmiths, to shop owners and even doctors. But this began to change with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. This period was characterized by a growing number of factories utilizing advanced technologies and machinery that needed to be set up and maintained by on-site employees. Also, this put family businesses out of business since they couldn't compete. And from this point, working from home wasn't a viable option anymore. Fast forward to the 1900s and corporate offices have begun to emerge. The need for dedicated common working areas became greater. This period also marked the first distinction between the office as a place to work and home as a place to live. Furthermore, the economic boom post-World War II meant that commuting was made easy with affordable cars and public transportation, which further enforced the office in the lives of many. Now, as employees became heavily reliant on means of transportation to commute, any shortage of energy meant high prices and the difficulty to get from one place to the other. Well, that's exactly what's happened during the energy crisis of the 1970s, and this was basically the first crisis in which remote working was perceived as a solution. Researchers tried to find new ways to restructure the economy and reduce the dependence on energy. The first attempt to address these issues was a book by Jack Niels called The Telecommunication Transportation Trade-Off. The book was a revelation at the time and was perceived by many as the foundation for the concept of telecommuting and working from remote locations. Well, unfortunately, the technologies at the time didn't really allow Niels' ideas to go into practice since PCs were relatively new. In fact, they were introduced during this period but the future was bright, and many businesses have been getting ideas. Among them was IBM, 
IBM led experiments with flexible hours and work from home initiatives in the 1980s. This time, technologies allowed remote working with the introduction of the internet and the intranet. Both technologies changed office life and facilitated the transition to remote working. Many companies followed suit in the 1990s and by the start of the 21st century, remote working started to gather momentum following the evolution of enterprise software. Now, another crisis that required a deep restructuring of the way we worked was the financial crisis of 2008. Businesses, big and small, leaned towards both freelance gigs and remote work. The reasoning behind both initiatives was to balance the books and cut costs, all while maintaining regular levels of productivity. The technologies available in the late 2000s, such as enterprise software, mobile devices, affordable laptops, and of course the internet with 3G and 4G and now 5G, facilitated the implementation of such strategies. During the decade following the financial crisis, more companies, especially from the tech world, such as Atlassian, GitHub, Basecamp, and Automatic, the parent company of WordPress, willingly adopted remote working strategies. In some businesses like Atlassian, for example, up to 70% of the workforce works remotely from various locations. Now, in addition to advances in technology, the recent shift towards more remote working can be attributed to the generational shift in the workplace and the high expectations of millennials and Gen Z. Now, according to the state of remote work by Buffer, a study of 2,500 remote workers, 98% of respondents were in favor of working remotely at least some of the time. A further 95% expressed their willingness to encourage their peers to do the same. Now, it is worth noting that this study was prior to the pandemic and earlier reports of 2019 and even uh, 20, 2018 also found the same results. In the same study, respondents explained their answers by stating that working remotely some of the time can bring them a number of benefits. Now, these benefits include uh, no to limited commuting, which significantly reduces stress and enhances the mood of employees, a flexible schedule, giving employees more time with their families and more free time in general, which also increases engagement rates and reduces turnover. Increased productivity. Now, increased productivity is a bit controversial since we are used to office life for generations now and working from home may lead some managers to think that they don't have control. But think of it this way. Working from home or any other convenient location means no commuting, as I mentioned earlier, no limited distractions and fewer coffee breaks or any kind of breaks for that matter. Actually, there was a two-year Stanford study of 500 employees divided into remote and office employees found an increase in productivity equal to a full day's work, fewer sick days, and 50% decrease in turnover. Now, another benefit is reduced costs. Employees would be saving money on transportation and other expenses, and businesses would obviously cut costs associated with renting offices, and they can hire more employees without having to expand their offices. Now, the last point is engaged employees and reduced turnover. Now, countless studies have proven that full-time or part or part-time remote working results in an engaged workforce and a high level of job satisfaction. According to the State of the American Workplace Report conducted by Gallup, working remotely for a few days a week can boost engagement, with employees who work 60 to 80% from home feeling more engaged. Well, although remote working brings a host of benefits, well, it can, if implemented wrongly, can bring more harm than good to your employees and business performance. It is often associated with a lack of communication, especially in the absence of specialized tools like chat application or video conferencing, and can lead to social withdrawal and isolation. Separating personal and professional life can also be an issue since remote employees feel the added pressure to perform and justify the privilege, although moving forward, remote working wouldn't be considered as a privilege anymore.
Another disadvantage of remote working is cybersecurity threats, since maybe employees would be using more their personal devices, and when we use our personal devices, we can be more vulnerable to attacks from uh, hackers and so on and so forth. So let's summarize the second part. History tells us that remote working is growing year on year. Employees expect it more often, and it brings benefits if implemented properly. So will it be the new normal? Well, nothing is for sure, but remote working would definitely be more common in the future as this period might have changed the perception of many regarding remote working. But it wouldn't replace the office as we know it. Well, I already wrote an article about this topic that I will include in the follow-up email. Uh, in the article, I spoke about the future of offices and whether they will be around in the long term. The answer is probably yes. We will witness some significant changes, obviously, in the workplace, but and we might also work remotely more often, but the office won't go away completely anytime soon. Now, let's move along to the last part, how to make working remotely work. So this last part would be for companies willing to pursue with remote working in the months or even years to come. I mean, who knows? Well, the key here is to place employees' needs at the heart of your strategy, since they are the most valuable asset of any company. But these needs evolve over time, and we need to be equipped with the right tools to satisfy them and help employees move up the pyramid to achieve their full potential. Maslow's pyramid here starts with physiological needs at the bottom, or simply the need to survive. We will just call them basic needs for the sake of this presentation to avoid confusion. In order to work remotely, employees need jobs that provide them with the right tools to work from home. Once these basic needs are met, employees need to feel safe and secure in terms of their physical and mental health, as well as their personal information, since they might be using their own devices to work. Now, basic and security needs represent the cornerstone of a good working experience in general, and they are equally, if not important, when it comes to remote working. But they're not enough. Employees need to be part of a whole part of a company that cares about them and constantly communicates with them. That's the third need of the pyramid, love and belonging. Now that employees are feeling the love, they have good and strong relationships with colleagues and the atmosphere at work is great. The next need is esteem. It can be either internal through self-satisfaction or external through public acclaim and recognition. When they reach this phase, employees tend to find meaning and satisfaction in their job and a push from management and their peers can make the difference between achieving self-actualization or leaving the job because they're not accomplished recognized or valued now for the next 10 minutes or so i will try to give some tips and best practices on how to satisfy each need some are based from my own experiences working from home and some from other successful companies that has been experimenting with remote working for a long time. Now, let's start by the basic needs. It goes without saying that the absence of the most basic needs for remote employees may lead to a decrease in productivity and retention rates. They can only be fulfilled by businesses that can adapt their policies. The first step is to assess the resources already in place by performing an audit that will help you determine a list of devices used within the company the software installed and running on those devices, whether you have the latest versions, and whether available tools can help you shift to a full remote working policy. Well, obviously, following the pandemic, we have all done some sort of an audit. So this step, moving forward, would consist of monitoring and building on existing resources. Then the next step, it is essential to get in touch with managers to figure out the needs of each team and determine teams who can work remotely with the tools they have and the ones who need some changes. For example, marketing and engineering teams have quite different needs in terms of software and hardware. From my own experience, me and my team, the marketing team, shifted to remote working without any drastic changes because we use laptops and web-based apps like Google Analytics and WordPress to get things done. For other teams, like engineers who use desktop PCs and sophisticated apps, it was quite different because some needed to install 
apps on their personal devices and needed to constantly communicate with IT to ensure the security of the transition. Another step to ensure the most essential needs are met is to think of a bring your own device policy. As it is the case with many companies, employees tend to use different communication tools to get in touch, like email, Skype, or even Facebook, without the knowledge of the IT department. This phenomenon is referred to as shadow IT and can have negative effects on, business, on businesses from the inability to control the software in use to compliance issues and costs associated with data loss. But a BioD policy can help facilitate remote working and overcome shadow IT by allowing the use of authorized personal software and hardware. This way, employees will be working with devices and solutions they are familiar with, thus reducing training and cutting costs. Now, depending on the initial audit, you may have an idea of the tools you already have at your disposal. You may think of adding other tools for certain teams and certain tasks, like a direct messaging or video conferencing tool to facilitate meetings, document management to store and organize company data and allow users to co-edit documents in real time, project management to create, schedule, and assign projects and tasks, enterprise social networks to connect employees and allow them to consult relevant activities through feeds and notifications, and of course, calendars to access, schedule, and share meetings and events. Now, just providing employees with tools isn't enough. A period of training is required, and there is a set of best practices that need to be followed to make the most out of these tools. You need to train your employees on how to communicate, how to find and locate information, and finally, how to get things done with the available tools they have. Now, when it comes to communication, try to organize regular meetings within dedicated channels and chat rooms. Now, the communication can be asynchronous or synchronous. Asynchronous communication is when you send a message without expecting an immediate response, like an email, for example. In contrast, Synchronous communication is when you send a message and the recipient processes the information and responds immediately, like in a meeting via Skype or using a chat application. Now, the next step is to make sure to share plans and priorities with the team. For example, something we have been doing here at EXO was to share our agendas within our group chats every morning, share the progress of different projects, and of course, the completing tasks. This way, everyone can stay on the same page and managers would have an easy time managing who is doing what without the need really for an employee management software or something like that. Now, the second part is to make sure employees know how and where to store knowledge. You can try to teach your employees to store and segment knowledge within spaces created for departments, teams, or projects. For example, each space can contain a document library in which you can share all types of knowledge like documents, training materials, images, whatever, that can be used by the space's members. You can also use wikis to share and consolidate knowledge like uh, company policies, guidelines, and meeting notes, of course. You can also try to collaborate on documents using online office suites like OnlyOffice, Office Online, and Google Drive that makes it easy to track changes and compare versions. Now, the next point is to show employees how to get things done with the tools they have. First, you have to make sure to define roles and responsibilities and create detailed tasks for team members. You can do that with a standalone project management solution or a built-in functionality within your digital workplace. Next, you can track progress and status using workflow processes and you can share updates on projects and activities, keeping everyone on the same page. For that, you can post updates on team spaces or dedicated chat rooms. Now, once you have provided employees with the right set of tools to work from home, the next step is to ensure their security and safety. By safety, we mean physical, mental, and cybersecurity. 
Before the crisis, we didn't need to know much about cybersecurity because we are at the office all the time within a secure environment. But now things have changed. We are working from home and we may continue to do so in the future. So we need to be knowledgeable, not experts, but knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. That's why it is crucial to communicate security and safety guidelines and educate employees on some threats that they might be facing, such as uh, phishing emails, for example. You also need to take the necessary uh, security measures, like uh, protecting company data by providing VPN access to employees. You can make sure you have to make sure to store information in cloud-based applications only accessible through different layers of authentication. Autent sorry. You can also uh, provide employees with health and safety advice, especially remote working, even in the long term, uh, can help stall an employee's mental health. So it's quite quintessential to make sure uh, employees always have the assistance needed by the HR department. Now, uh, working from home uh, for prolonged periods of time following a pandemic or even by choice can lead your employees to feel lonely, disconnected, and negatively affects engagement rates. This is why internal communications are essential to tackle these challenges. And this is basically the third need of the pyramid. But for internal communications to be effective, it needs to be tied to smart objectives. They need to be specific, like for example, increase engagement, uh, the percentage of likes or email open rates, for example. Measurable, meaning that you have to use tools with analytics features to find out, for example, how many people shared the news internally, who are the most engaged users, etc. The objectives also need to be achievable, which means that you need to be able to achieve the objective you have set with available resources. Realistic, or in simple terms, keep your objectives real. And timely, you want to achieve the objectives in the next quarter or something like that. Now, once the objectives are clear to the project stakeholders, it is time to develop a content plan that will take into consideration the needs of remote employees, and then you can select the right channels through which HR or communication specialists, for example, can get their messages across. You may use a typical internet solution or a digital workplace with a news feature or a microblogs, for example. And most importantly, you have to continuously analyze results in order to identify areas of improvements and build on the campaigns that you already did. Now, here are some tips on how to engage remote communities. First, content is king. You can keep the community informed with the latest company news, announcement, and events. You can also encourage remote employees to share their experiences and tips on how they manage their workday. This can be beneficial to office employees who may consider to give remote working a chance in the future. You can also share fun content like uh, small contests, uh, videos, and GIFs that can be shared within spaces designed for non-work-related activities in which employees can come together and basically have a break. Now, the last point is to run polls and surveys to figure out whether the remote working works and actually build on that. For example, if employees say they are not happy, you need to figure out why through a qualitative approach and basically let everyone voice their opinion freely. Now, let's move to the fourth part of uh, the pyramid. Now, the fourth need in Maslow's pyramid is esteem. Employees need to be recognized and valued in order to go the extra mile. First, you would have to determine what kind of actions should be recognized and rewarded. Now, the actions and behaviors that can result in recognition and public praise have to be directly tied to your business's overall objectives and vision. For example, if customer support is a top priority for your business, the employees with the highest satisfaction ratings or the most complete support tickets will publicly, will, can be publicly praised for their achievements. But who should give this recognition? Now, the most common form of recognition is top-down although it's not enough on its own. It has, to be, it has been proven by a number of studies that peer-to-peer -peer recognition is equally, if not more important, in boosting morale, promote a collaborative culture, and push employees to go the extra mile. 
Now, how should we recognize employees and how often? Now, there are there are a multitude of ways in which you can recognize the good work of your employees. Recognition has to be frequent and uh, can be verbal, written, or tied to tangible rewards, such as bonuses, gift cards, or tokens, etc. There has been a growing interest in recognition from tech companies in recent years. Uh, this has resulted in the appearance of a number of platforms dedicated to recognition and rewards. And new initiatives by platforms such as LinkedIn, for example, that, gave, that gives users the opportunity to praise their peers for their efforts. Now, digital workplace solutions are also adopting such techniques to facilitate and promote public recognition in the workplace. So whether you opt for the recognition software or a digital workplace with a built-in recognition feature, keep in mind your team's preferences and your business's objectives and choose the rewards that your employees are more, are more interested in. Now, once each need is more or less uh, met, employees can reach the tip of the pyramid. Now, what they need is a clear career path, meaning those who have opted to work remotely can have the same opportunities as their peers who are working from the office. Managers also need to maintain honest and transparent discussions with employees and put emphasis on their self-development. This way, employees are ready to reach their full potential and have a complete work, remote working experience. Now, we have reached the end of this webinar, so I will leave the floor for you guys to ask some questions, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, so I have a question right here. How do you prepare your business for long-term remote working? Well, actually, as I discussed, uh, the key is to kill, to put your employees at the heart of your remote working strategy. And for that, you need to assess what you have. Basically, as we studied in business school, know what you have in order to move forward. So basically, we need to know how we do, we, we do work and with, uh, with which tools and then you can move forward. Uh, actually, in the presentation, I discussed how it is important to assess uh, the resources that you have, both in terms of uh, IT, uh, software, and the people, and build on that. And uh, especially, you need to monitor results and continuously improve uh, your remote working strategies and tactics. So basically, you would have an overall strategy, and then you have tactics uh, with which you can tackle different emerging issues. Uh, I'm still waiting for you guys' questions. Uh...
I think we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, I have trouble seeing that some uh, some some participants are asking questions, but I really have trouble to really hear them. So uh, you guys can use the chat application, the question box to to ask your questions. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello, sir. Hi, how are you? This is Malik. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Um, Thanks, man. Actually, I have, I have, I have one question. Um, regarding the, um, the actually, the, the employers would like to implement this scheme. Is there any kind of resistance from the employers to implement this kind of scheme and why? From employers or employees? Employers. Yes, I mean, uh, basically, if you have a look at uh, the age of CEOs now, they're old, to be honest, and uh, there is always a resistance to change. I mean, basically, it's not related only to remote working, but the tools that people use in the office. Uh, for example, there is always a resistance to implement the latest technologies like digital workplace solutions. And uh, in the near future, there is often a resistance to uh, introduce artificial intelligence or the Internet of Things. So there will always be a resistance to uh, working remotely. And uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, working in from the office and the office in general as a concept has been engraved in our uh, in our normal life so it would be hard to transition from the office to working remotely and as I said during the, the presentation it will take time it will be a, a gradual change but uh, one day uh, we will reach not full remote working but uh, remote working will be more common especially after the pandemic thank you very much for your answer do you guys have any other questions? Uh, you can use the question box because I think that we have uh, some technical difficulties with the audio. So you can use the question box to uh, ask me any kind of questions. Well, uh, I'm still uh, managing the technical difficulties that we're having. Uh, either way, you guys can ask your questions in the question box or I can uh, end the webinar now and you guys can uh, ask me your questions uh, when you receive the follow-up email. So again, thank you guys very much. And uh, I hope this was my first webinar and I hope this will be the first of many. So thank you very much guys for attending and I will send you uh, a follow-up email containing uh, the recording as well as the different studies that I mentioned during the presentation. Thank you guys very much and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.